Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this uh, academy lecture by Professor Jennifer Graves. And who she is and what she does, what she will tell us about. I ask Professor Usha Vijayaragam to tell you all about it. So Usha, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you, uh, Rohini. So those of you who have had had the pleasure of meeting uh, Jenny Graves over her couple of previous visits to IISC, you will be well in tune to the fact that she is a enthralling speaker. And the topic on which she speaks is even more enthralling. Um, so I think we're in for a treat. Uh, Jenny Graves is a very, very distinguished evolutionary geneticist. And she has used Australia's unique mammalian species as her laboratory system. And um, her work has been exemplary. They've discovered many new principles of how sex can be determined in, in organisms that we all see in the zoo, at best, sometimes see in the nature. Um, her work has been so good and so well recognized. She's been Australia's first Prime Minister's uh, Prize who is a woman, and this is being done for her work on genomic and epigenetic research on uh, mammalian species. She's got several other awards too, many of them. Uh, one of the other ones that I must mention is that she is a laureate, UNESCO laureate. She is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences and has served as their first foreign secretary. Um, she's currently a distinguished professor at the La Trobe University and her prior education was both in Australia and in America. She got her PhD at Berkeley. Jenny, it's a pleasure to always listen to you and uh, welcome to the campus again. Well, thank you very much, Usha, for your welcome. on the egg-laying mammals, the monotremes, and now we're going back even further. Uh, we've looked at birds and reptiles, and now we're going right back to 310 million years ago. And I won't talk about frogs and fish in this talk, but uh, we can go right back to the dawn of tetrapods. So uh, genomics is a bit of a buzzword. I'm sure you've all heard about genomics. Uh, it took uh, about 10 years and $3 billion to sequence the entire human genome. Uh, we were very keen to sequence a marsupial genome, and we did the opossum um, in 2007. That only cost $18 million, and we've done the kangaroo more recently, and now there's all kinds of different marsupials being, um, being sequenced. We're just about to publish the koala sequence. And 
We've also been able to get a complete sequence of the genome of the platypus too, with uh, collaboration with the United States. Um, but more and more there are birds and snakes and frogs and fish whose genome is being sequenced. And that is really giving us a huge amount of data to compare between species. So I want to make sure that everybody here understands uh, the relationship between DNA and genes and chromosomes. So forgive me if I'm being a little too elementary. Uh, but uh, essentially our genome is one metre or so of DNA. And that meter of DNA has about 23,000 genes on it, which is our complete genome. Uh, so that's a lot of DNA to squish into one little cell, because every cell has the same genome. So for convenience, it's chopped up um, into smaller fragments. And these, these uh, smaller fragments condense when the cell divides, so you can actually see them down under the microscope, and we call them chromosomes. And so what we can do is to take these uh, chromosomes, which are essentially long bits of DNA, and we can uh, cut them out and stick them in on a page in order of their size. Oh, well, first of all, I should, I should uh, mention that we actually have two genomes, one from our mothers and one from our fathers. So we have two, two um, copies of each chromosome. Uh, and then if we line these up in order of size, you can see them. But of course, by the time we see them down the microscope, they've already duplicated. So what you actually see is something that looks like this. So I hope that's a very quick explanation of how um, DNA is related to the genome, is related to chromosomes. So our set of chromosomes represents our entire genomes of our mother and our father. Uh, so if you look at um, the chromosomes of humans, you're probably all aware we've got more than four chromosomes. We've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. And again, you can cut them out and organise them by size. And they look like this for a female and like this for a male. And you can see there's um, chromosomes come in pairs, one from mother, one from father. Uh, and the female and the male are absolutely equivalent except for this chromosome here. And this is called the X chromosome because it's so unusual. X stands for unknown. So there's two copies in a female and a single copy in a male. But it's even stranger than this because the male has a specific little teeny weeny chromosome called a Y chromosome. And that's male specific. And that's the important chromosome for sex determination because we know that that's where the gene is that makes a baby male. And we know that because there are people who are born with various uh, abnormal confluence of X chromosomes, and that makes no difference. But if you've got a Y, you're a male, and if you lack a Y, you're a female. So it's always been said that the gene that, that determines sex has got to be somewhere on the Y chromosome. So this is something that um, I accidentally got involved in during the 80s. Uh, Sex differences, of course, there are lots and lots of sex differences, and I used to go around and get people to very quickly write down all the differences they can think of between men and women. Um, and I've stopped doing that because I always got the same answers, whether it was a high school class or the Royal Society of New Zealand, they gave me essentially these answers. So these are not my answers, this is what people will tell you if you ask them very rapidly to write down sex differences. And it's, it's very funny because hardly anybody mentions the fact that men make sperm and women make eggs, which is, after all, the reason we have two different sexes, but they concentrate on the reproductive equipment um, and particularly sexual, secondary sexual characteristics like um, uh, size and hairiness and so forth. And also, very much, they concentrate on behaviour. And of course, it's very controversial as far as what behaviours are in making sex and what uh, behaviours are socially constrained. So of all these differences, what really counts in sex determination is one of these, and that is whether the, uh, whether the baby has testicles or not. Because if the baby has te testicles um, in utero, uh, the testicles will make hormones and they'll make the baby male. So what happens is there's a, a, a strip of cells that's the undifferentiated gonad, and if that strip receives a testis-determining factor, whatever it is, it turns into a testis, 
And if that same strip of cells doesn't receive the testis determining factor, it turns into an ovary. So this testis determining factor was obviously the key to making male babies. So what is that testis determining factor? Everybody was asking this in the 1980s. This was nothing to do with me. I wasn't working on it at all. But I was aware that there had been um, a lot of interest in what is TDF and what does it do? Well, it turns on testis, so it obviously turns on other genes that make the testis. And the testis makes hormones, and the hormones make the baby male. And the first gene that was cloned from a human Y chromosome was a gene called the zinc finger gene on the Y chromosome. And it looked like a very, very good candidate for sex determination. It was expressed in the right place in males only. And it was a sort of, um, it made the sort of protein that interacts with other genes and turns them on. But uh, David Page, who discovered this gene, called me up one night and asked me if we could map this gene in kangaroos. Because he said, well, if it's the right gene, it should be on the Y chromosome in all mammals, including marsupials. So I gave this job to two of my graduate students, Jamie Foster and Andrew Sinclair, um, and they went away and mapped this gene, and to their shock, they found it was not on the Y chromosome. It was actually on chromosome 5 in kangaroos and chromosome 3 in this other little marsupial mouse species. So it's in the wrong place and it must be the wrong gene. And it was Andrew Sinclair who, after he got his PhD in my lab, went to London and it was he who cloned the right gene, which is called SRY. And I should just mention that I thought that the, the boys would get a little note somewhere rather in an undistinguished journal, but they ended up with a cover story in Nature and that made them both very famous. So it was Andrew who cloned the SRY gene, and we know that's the right gene because if it's mutated, um, you, you get girls who have a Y chromosome but a mutation in the SRY gene. And you can also get transgenic mice. You can take uh, mouse eggs with two X chromosomes in them and inject this gene, and that egg will turn into a male. So we know that's the right gene. So it was Andrew who cloned that gene with Jamie's help and many people in Peter Goodfellow's lab. And then Jamie came back into my lab and he cloned another gene that nobody knew existed on the X chromosome, which was very similar. And it turns out that that is the ancestor of the SRY gene. And he cloned another related gene that turns out to be the target of SRY. So this was an amazing, uh, uh, an, an amazing story starting from a phone call. Well, how does SRY work? We thought it would be really easy. You know, SRY makes testis, maybe um, it directly influences genes that make a testis. Um, that's not really the case. It's much more complicated than that. There are many steps downstream and also upstream. And they've been investigated uh, by many people, including Andrew, uh, in people who are born apparently of the wrong sex people with a Y chromosome who are female, and people with no Y chromosome who are male. And it turns out they have mutations in at least 30 different genes. So this is actually what the pathway looks like at the moment. And here's SRY kind of in the middle, and SOX9 its target, but you can see there's, there's genes that turn on testis, and there's other genes that turn on ovary, but there's also some genes that inhibit testis, and some genes that inhibit ovary as well. So it's really kind of a complicated story. Um, and there's many genes in this pathway that we'll hear about later because they're sex determining, for instance, in chickens, this one, this one um, probably in platypuses, this one in lizards, and this one probably in temperature sensitive sex. So they're all kind of involved in the same pathway, but they can take slightly different roles. So this is what this, the, I think the pathway probably really looks like. It's probably much more complicated than we think, and there are all sorts of things going on. Um, if a blue ball ends up in the ridge, it turns into a testis, and if it doesn't, it turns into an ovary. So I think we're probably still missing many, many links in a very complicated chain of events. So I want to talk about sex chromosomes now, where they come from and where they're going to. Um, so 
These are the human sex chromosomes. The X is quite a large chromosome, lots of genes on it, and the Y is a very funny looking little thing with hardly any genes. So sex chromosomes are really weird. The very top is actually shared between the X and the Y. And that's how they stick together at the reduction division which makes sperm. And it's very important that they stick together because otherwise the man is sterile. But the rest of the X chromosome, and remember there's two in females and only one in males, has got lots of genes on it and they do all kinds of different things. So they, they code for, for instance, blood clotting factors and visual pigments and enzymes, nothing particularly to do with sex. But it's not really an ordinary normal chromosome because there's many, too many genes, many more than you'd expect, that have some role in the brain. And also there's too many genes that have some role in the gonads. So the strange thing is that a lot of these are the same genes. So you get a lot of excellent mental retardation that boys who are mentally retarded who also have something wrong with their gonads. And that's been a puzzle for a long time. I call these genes brains and balls genes. So the, the X chromosome is quite a specialised chromosome. And this is the way I represent it. It's a very smart and sexy chromosome because of all these extra genes that it has evolved. Well, the Y chromosome is quite different because the bottom part of the Y, that's male specific, has only got 27 genes on it that actually code for protein. Um, there's lots of DNA junk, lots of repetitive sequences and, and old viruses and dying genes. So it's a, a bit of a genetic wasteland. Uh, but these 27 genes um, mostly have male specific functions. So a lot of them, uh, for instance, are required for making sperm. The odd thing is that most Y genes have a copy on the X chromosome. And so we formulated the theory many years ago that the Y chromosome is actually a degraded copy of the X. So the Y chromosome is a wimp, and that's my cartoon of the Y chromosome. It's just a, a degraded copy of this erstwhile, um, its glorious progenitor, which is, of course, the X chromosome. So really, when you think about it, sex chromosomes are nothing but trouble. Um, there's problems at meiosis because they don't pair very well. There's dosage problems because there's two copies in females and only one in males, so you have to have this dosage compensation mechanism. There's all sorts of sex diseases that males get because they've only got one copy of X, and if it has a mutant gene on it, it's bad luck. There's no backup. And there's also many sex reversal syndromes. So you've really got to ask, well, why are they so weird? Is it so they work better, or is it some horrible evolutionary accident? And I'm here to tell you they don't work very well, and indeed it is an accident, and it's a lovely example of what I call dumb design. That's, of course, in distinction to intelligent design, which was... And the theory is that once upon a time, the X and the Y were just an ordinary pair of chromosomes until one day, one partner acquired a male-determining gene. And for mammals, of course, that's SRY. And then what happened was that there was a, a selection for other genes with a, a, an advantage in males to be acquired right around this locus here. So you then get other male advantage genes accumulating or evolving around that locus. And what happens then is to keep those genes together in a sort of male-specific package, what happens is that uh, you get a, a loss of recombination because normally these two, these two X chromosomes will recombine and swap partners all the time. And that's what my little dotted lines represent. So here you can see uh, there's a hole in my doctor blind where you don't get recombination. And in that region there, you get all kinds of horrible genetic accidents occur. You get um, deletions and mutations uh, and inversions and insertions of junk. 
and we think that's what happened very, very rapidly. So the Y chromosome has degraded, all except the very top bit. So that's pretty much a description of a human X and Y chromosome. The Y has got hardly any genes left on it, except right at the top. But the X is pretty much the same as it always was, except it's specialised, as we said. But this is not the end of the story, because in fact the Y chromosome can degrade further and further until it doesn't pair with the X at all, and it shares nothing with the X. And that's actually the way it is in marsupials. But lastly and scarily, it could completely disappear. So what happens then, I'll tell you about later in the talk. So essentially the Y chromosome is a degraded X chromosome. And that's where the Y came from. So what that means is we might expect that the genes on the Y chromosome all evolve from genes on the X chromosome. And these are three genes we happen to know a bit about, and they're the ones that we happen to have discovered their partners on the X. So these two genes here, IBM Y and TSP Y, have something to do with making sperm. And we discovered that both of them have a partner on the X from which they clearly evolved. And even SRY itself, we discovered the SOX3 gene from which SRY clearly evolved. So what's happened here is these are all brains and balls genes, and once they get isolated on the Y chromosome, they become sex and sperm genes. So this is a very general story of Y chromosomes all around the world, is that they are breakdown products of the X chromosome, and the genes on them have mostly uh, evolved from genes which were always on the X, and in fact, they're present in all tetrapods. Well, what about the evolution of these genes? Um, each one is a really interesting story. I'll tell you just about SRY itself, because uh, the, we did some studies of the SOX3 gene, and it's not sex determining. It's active in the brain and in the germ cells, but not in the testis, the part of the testis that makes you male. However, if by some accident this gene becomes active in the test, in the, um, the gonad, it will form a testis. And there were two babies that were born who had no SRY, but their SOX3 gene was accidentally active in the genital ridge. And we can now do the same thing with transgenic mice. So I, I've always said, well, I, obviously what's happened is some horrible accident to SOX3, a breakage, so uh, the, the left side of the gene is gone now, and it's been replaced by a promoter, a sequence that drives its expression into the gonad. So now you have um, this gene is being expressed in the gonad, it becomes sex determining, and you have a new gene, the SRY gene, which now specialises in sex determination. So it's actually easy to make novel sex determining genes. And we now have many, many examples, particularly in fish, of novel sex determining genes that were made out of perfectly ordinary um, genes that were not sex determining. So I want to say a few words about where our sex chromosome came from. And this was work we did over many years comparing the X chromosome um, of uh, humans with other vertebrates. The Y chromosome, of course, is a degraded product of the X, so we're looking at the Y as well. So I'll just tell you a little bit about how we do this. We have some really pretty, pretty um, techniques. We first of all can look at chromosomes under the microscope, and these happen to be the chromosomes of a kangaroo, which we were studying at the time. And you can see that the X and the Y is perfectly obvious uh, which ones they are, because they don't pair, rather odd looking. Uh, they're very pretty chromosomes, so pretty they actually made a stamp out of them. And we have many techniques that we can use to figure out where genes are on these chromosomes. And the most successful one is a, a, a technique by which we take large chunks of kangaroo DNA that we can so-called clone, um, and we, we choose them so that they have a gene on it which is very conserved. It's the same gene in humans and kangaroos. And what we can do then is to tag it with a dye, and then we can um, put that DNA onto a slide with chromosomes all spread out, where the DNA has the strands have come apart, 
And now our fluorescent probe homes in on where its sequence is and binds there. So you can see yellow dots, and that tells you just where the gene is. So this was kind of like a dream come true. I always used to think, oh, I wish you could actually see where a gene is when you can, and here it is. And we've got another lovely, uh, so what we've been able to do is map all the genes in kangaroos, and um, they are mapped uh, about 400 of them, and then we can figure out, well, where are these genes in humans? So we've color coded this kangaroo uh, chromosomes with the colors from humans. And what you can see right away is that there's great chunks of yellow in there. That's human chromosome one. So human chromosome one is alive and well in a kangaroo. And same genes in the same order, doing the same jobs essentially. And you can see chromosome two and three, and they've been rearranged some, but actually not as much as we would have thought. So it's the same genome, but it has just been rearranged somewhat. We've also got another lovely technique um, where we can take whole chromosomes and sort them um, and make DNA from a whole chromosome 2 or a whole chromosome 7 and then you use that as our probe. So here for instance we've taken um, from one species of kangaroo we've taken the chromosome 2, that's the green bit, chromosome 7, that's the pink bit and the X chromosome, that's the white bit. And then we can use those probes on a different species even. And it homes into the same sequences in the different species and we can compare the whole chromosomes of that species. So here's a species which was once very famous because it has huge, huge chromosomes. But you can see all they are is two chromosomes kind of hacked together. So we've been able to look at all the chromosomes of all the marsupials in the world and we find that it's really the same 19 blocks of the genome that have been rearranged somewhat differently in different lineages. And we can then go right back and tell you what was the common ancestor of all marsupials. So uh, marsupials are easy because they haven't changed that much. And that means if we do the genome of one species, we can predict what the genome of other species is. So what we've done then is to simply compare chromosomes right across this um, lineage of uh, uh, vertebrates and starting for instance with the elephant. So one of my students looked at the elephant X chromosomes and mapped 43 genes on the elephant X. And what she found is it's the same genes in the same order. The only difference is where the centromere is. That's the, the bit that joins the two daughter chromosomes. Uh, so essentially it's the same old X and we find that right throughout the placental mammals. But it was a different story when we got to kangaroos. So here's for instance our kangaroo chromosomes and we're mapping here two genes that are very close together on the human X chromosome. And you can see they're very close together on the kangaroo X chromosome too. And we find that's the case of all the genes in the bottom two thirds of the human X. But the surprising thing is we found that the genes um, on the top of the human X are not there at all, they're on chromosome five. And in fact, all those genes are in the same place on chromosome five. So it looks like there's actually two bits to our X chromosome um, that were probably originally separated. And we get the same results if we do chromosome painting. These are the blood lymphocytes of one of my, um, my students. And he took the kangaroo X chromosome paint and put them on his own cells. And what he found was he has one X chromosome and the bottom two thirds of it is painted and the top one third of it is not. So it looks like there's actually two blocks um, of two ancestral blocks. So here it is, for instance, here's our uh, X chromosome of the kangaroo is in blue because it's the same as the human and the elephant, X, the bottom part of that X chromosome. But the top bit is green because it's actually on another chromosome. So if we paint all of these chromosomes in kangaroo colours, it looks like this. And what you can see is it looks like there's been two ancestral blocks of, of chromosome that have come together in the ancestor of the elephant and now they're just hitched up at the centromere. And all that's happened in humans is that the centromere slipped down a little bit. Well, of course, it could equally 
be that the ancestral X chromosome was like the human X and it got um, chopped up in marsupials. So we went further away and looked at it in platypuses and we found the same two blocks of material. Um, we found the ancient X and we found the bit that was added to it, which is I've coloured in green. The really surprising thing, though, was that it was not on the X chromosome in a platypus. It's actually chromosome 6, which has got nothing to do with sex. So it looks like the platypus has got completely different sex chromosomes to humans and kangaroos. And we did the same thing with the chicken and uh, mapped the same genes. And again, we got them into two uh, blocks, same genes in the same order even, but they're not on sex chromosomes. So what that means is that the X chromosome of humans and other mammals was derived from two um, ancient blocks of material that got put together about 105 million years ago. Um, and I call them the X conserved region, that's the blue bit, and the X added region, that's the green bit. So those two got put together and uh, into our X chromosome. You can see, I haven't said much about the Y chromosome, but you can see the Y chromosome, is, as I said before, is a degraded X chromosome, but in fact, it mostly comes from the added bit, the green bit. So there's hardly any genes uh, from the original Y chromosome. Well, I've just talked about humans and other mammals, and they have a sex uh, systems like this, so the male is called the heterogametic sex because it makes two kinds of sperm, X-bearing and Y-bearing. So it's the sex that chooses um, the sex of the baby. Um, and here's what we just talked about. The, uh, there's a, a gene on the Y chromosome, in this case it's SRY, and it's a dominant, if you've got it, you're male. But that's not the only way you can have XY systems. You could also have uh, the same chromosomes, but this time it could be a gene on the X chromosome that determines femaleness. So two copies of that gene and you're female, one copy and you're male. And that's the way it is in fruit flies. Or it could be completely the other way around, and it could be the female that makes two different kinds of eggs. We call this the chromosome Z and W, but in this case, the female has a single Z chromosome and the male has two. And the female has a specific W chromosome, which again is very small and largely junk. Or you could have, again, the same setup, but this time you have a gene on the Z chromosome, which acts by its dosage. Two copies, you new male, a single copy, you new female. And it turns out that that's the way birds do it. So there's all these four formal possibilities. And so if we look at the species we saw didn't have the same sex system as humans, what do we find? Well, platypuses turned out to be the real, the real key to understanding everything, though they are very bizarre. Well, platypuses are mammals, they have fur and they feed their young with milk, but they retain a lot of reptile characteristics. For instance, their skeleton is more like a lizard, so their, their legs go like that instead of straight out like, like a dog's legs. Um, but lay, the main difference is that they actually lay eggs. So they lay little leathery eggs, a bit like snakes and other reptiles do. And the male platypus makes venom, much like snakes' venom. So they are definitely mammals, but they're kind of an intermediate between mammals and reptiles. And one thing that's very reptilian is their chromosomes. So we did a lot of work trying to figure out which chromosome was which, because there's a lot of very small little chromosomes in a platypus, as there is in a bird and a snake. So platypus sex chromosomes, well, that should be easy. You just look at the chromosomes of a male and look at the chromosomes of a female, and you'll find that um, there's two chromosomes that don't match in a male, that's an XY system, or a female, that's a ZW system. So if we looked at the chromosomes of a female, it's perfectly normal, um, they all pair. But we looked at the chromosomes of a male and found not two that don't match, but ten. And we said, well, that's ridiculous. You can't have 10 sex chromosomes, but you do. 
there's five X chromosomes that are present in two copies in females and one copy in males. And there's five Y chromosomes, which are male specific. So that's a bit of a dilemma. What's a poor little baby platypus supposed to do if it gets some crazy sort of mixture of X's and Y chromosomes? Uh, so we looked at meiosis, that's a reduction division where you make sperm. Um, and what we found is that these, nine, these ten sex chromosomes were all arrayed in the order X1 and X, um, Y1, X2, Y2, in a long, long chain. And we think what happens, because we could look at what happened to them in sperm, is all the X chromosomes go to one end of the cell and all the Y chromosomes go to the other, so you just get two kinds of sperm, one that has all the X's in it and one that has all the Y's in it. So it's a crazy system, but it works. And it's a wonderful e example of dumb design. So evolution has not come up with the most sensible uh, solution, but it's a solution that works and that's all evolution cares about. Well, what about the genes on the platypus sex chromosomes? Because we find there's no homology to the human X chromosome. But the weird thing is we got a lot of homology to the chicken sex chromosomes. So all those green genes there are genes that are on the bird sex chromosomes. And there's no SRY, so what's the sex determining gene? We think it's probably a gene called the anti-malarian hormone which is sex determining in some fish because this got tacked on to the X and the Y chromosomes. So the platypus is really, really weird, but it, what it's telling us is that um, you, can make, you can do sex in a variety of different ways using a variety of different genes. Or what about birds? We've known for a long time that chickens have sex chromosomes, but they're a Z and W system, so there's ZZ males, ZW females, um, and the W is a very pathetic little chromosome with hardly any genes on it, like the Y chromosome. It's completely different from the human XY, there's no genes in common at all. In fact, the chicken Z is equivalent mostly to human chromosome 4. Well, one of my students, Swathi Shetty, from Bangalore, looked at a very weird bird. That's one of the big flightless birds called an emu. And what she found with the emu is it has sex chromosomes that, in fact, the W chromosome is almost as big as the Z chromosome. So we have here exactly the same evolutionary principle as I showed you before, but the other way around. So here it's the W chromosome which is being degraded gradually. And what it turns out is that the sex-determining gene we now know is a gene called DMRT1, and it's the dosage that uh, is different. So two copies of the DMRT1 gene on the Z chromosome and your male, but there's no copy on the W chromosome, even in uh, an emu, and so you're female. So if we look at snakes now, it's exactly the same. We have snakes that have a ZW system, uh, and the W is much like the Z, uh, so the boyd snakes, the pythons and boa constrictors are like that. Um, but the vipers all have very, uh, very diverged W chromosomes that are very different from the Z chromosome. Again, it looks like the bird system, but it's a completely different chromosome. So in fact, um, the snake Z is equivalent to the bird chromosome 2, and we don't know what the sex determining gene is. So uh, putting all this together, it's the same genome that all these creatures have. Basically it's the same genome, and we can go back and tell you what the ancestral genome looked like. And what we can say, it's the same genome, but different bits of it became sex chromosomes in different lineages. So the yellow bit became a ZW system in snakes and the red bit became a ZW in birds, completely independently. Uh, the bird system seems to have morphed into the weird platypus system with the little blue bit is actually carrying the sex-determining gene. And marsupials now have the blue bit has become sex-determining quite independently and it's the same in humans and other placental mammals except the green bits got added too. 
Uh, the nice thing about this is that we can date our sex chromosomes because we say, well, SRY must have been in invented somewhere between platypuses and kangaroos' um, divergence from, mam from other mammals. Uh, so our XY system is only about 150 million years old, which is considerably younger than anybody thought. Well, if we look at the future of our sex chromosomes, it doesn't look too good. We know we started off with sex chromosomes were absolutely equivalent. They weren't sex chromosomes at all in a chicken and a monotreme. Um, but we now that know that now um, humans and elephants share a system in which the X and the Y are nearly completely different and the Y is very much degraded. We know that in marsupials, the Y has become even more degraded and doesn't pair with the X at all. What happens when it disappears? Well, there actually are some rodents in which it's disappeared. So we can sort out, well, when's it going to disappear first? We know how old it is, 166 million years. We know how many genes it had to begin with because that's the number of genes on the X chromosome. We can calculate it to disappear in 4.6 million years. There it goes. So, of course, the big question is, well, will males disappear? And what happens if they do? Will we become a race of parthenogenetic females? And that's not crazy because some lizards do that. Um, the females just make eggs out of their, their own genes. That can't work in humans or other mammals because we've got at least 30 genes that are only active in certain chromosomes and they can't be and they're very important developmental genes. So we do need men and we do need sperm and we'll all become extinct if they become extinct. That's the good news for the men. Um, so what's going to happen? Will we become extinct? No, we don't need to because maybe we'll evolve a new sex-determining gene. Just like XRY was evolved 150 million years ago, maybe we'll start on another gene. And that's actually happened in two lineages of rodents. This is my favourite one, the Japanese spiny rat. There's one species that has a Y chromosome, but there's two other species that have lost it completely. And it looks like a new de uh, sex-determining gene has evolved, a CBX2, which is actually in that, um, that, that uh, pathway that I showed you before. So maybe that will happen. Um, maybe there will be a population of spiny rat kind of humans. Um, that's not going to work terribly well. What if a XX woman mates with a spiny rat man? Uh, there will be a war of the sex genes and you'll get a lot of infertility. And of course, this is exactly the, uh, the reproductive barrier that when it's interposed, forces two populations apart to become separate species. So if you come back in 4.6 million years, you might find out either no humans or you might find several different hominid species, which is kind of a scary thought. So what I want to finish up talking about is you don't actually need sex chromosomes to do sex. For instance, we know that crocodiles and alligators and marine turtles um, don't have sex chromosomes. How do they do it? They do it by temperature. If the egg is incubated in the cold, they all uh, hatch as males. If the, the eggs are incubated in, uh, at a higher temperature, they're all females. So you don't need sex chromosomes, it's all environmental, and so sex determination must be what we call epigenetic. Well, this doesn't mean that the sex chromosomes are gone. They're actually still there. We were able to show by chromosome painting that um, the sex chromosomes are still there. For instance, this is the, uh, the bird's Z chromosome paint. And you can see the chromosomes are there. They're just not sex chromosomes. So uh, we, can, we can tell you that the human sex chromosomes are there and so are the bird's sex chromosomes, but they have nothing to do with sex. So epigenetics, I should explain, because that's a bit of a buzzword these days. Uh, but literally, it means over the gene. And it's not a new concept at all. It was introduced a long time ago to, uh, to talk about expression changes. So the genes are still there, but they can either be active or not active. And the classic example was of epigenetic silencing was in the 1960s, when Mary Lyon came up with the hypothesis that one 
uh, of the two X chromosomes in human females becomes inactive, genetically inactive. And I happen to be working on, on X chromosome inactivation, um, so I did some of the, uh, the very early molecular work to, to show, first of all, that this amounted to the inactive X is not being uh, copied into RNA. So all the genes on it are inactive. Um, and I was able to also show that DNA methylation was one thing that stopped these genes from being copied. Uh, so if the, here's DNA, you can see there's a little methyl group on it that inhibits the copying mechanism to RNA. But we now know that's only one way in which these genes are silenced. There's a very complex series of changes that occur to histone molecules. Histone molecules are kind of uh, what DNA globs onto and winds around like beads on a string. And if you modify the chemically these histones, you can make uh, that DNA either active or inactive. So we now know there's many, many genes that are involved in epigenetic silencing, largely by modifying the histones or the DNA. So we were very lucky then that we chose to um, work on a, a lizard in Australia that we thought was interesting because it has genetic sex determination, but related species have got temperature sex determination. And we thought, well, there might be something interesting to look at here. So we looked at the chromosomes and, oh boy, um, they're not very easy to look at. They all look the same and there's a whole lot of little teeny mini chromosomes that look like bits of dust. So this didn't look very promising, but one of the postdocs in my lab, Teresa Zaz, I was able to use very sophisticated cytogenetics to pick out the W chromosome, which was female specific. Uh, so what you can do is what we call comparative genome hybridization and pull out sequences that are sex specific. So we could pick out the Z and pick out the W chromosome. We could literally scratch it off the microscope slide, make DNA out of it, and then use that to pull out of a library of sequences from this animal, pull out um, very large clones that contained the uh, sequences which were on the Z and W. And this, of course, was not as easy as it sounds, but what we found when we sequenced these um, big bits of DNA was a whole bunch of genes which are on the chicken chromosome 23. Now, chicken chromosome 23 is not a sex chromosome, but we know what genes were on it, and one of them was extremely interesting was a sterogenic factor, SF1, which we know is involved in human sex determination. And we think that's probably our sex determining gene in our dragon lizard. So we now have a full genome sequence of the dragon lizard, and we're now starting to assess this gene for being a sex determining gene. But meanwhile, we found some really strange things about this lizard. We incubated eggs over a range of temperature, and there were half boys and half girls, as we expected, but we pushed the temperature higher, they were all girls. And half those females were ZW, which they should have been. The other half of the females were ZZ, so they should have been males, but the high temperature was somehow overriding the sex factor. And we thought, well, that's pretty interesting. I wonder what would happen if we take our ZZ females and mate them to ZZ males. So that's what we did. So we completely got rid of the W chromosome and it turned out our ZZ sex reverse females were viable and fertile. In fact, they're better females than their normal sisters. And so when we did this mating, all the hatchlings had ZZ chromosomes because there is no W and their sex completely depends on the temperature. So in one generation, we've turned a genetic sex determining system into a temperature sex determining system. And people were really shocked, and that's why we got a front cover of Nature. They were really shocked because it, this was supposed to be impossible, but in fact it's very, very easy to do. And the scary thing is it's happening in the wild. So we, we've been sampling in this one spot for 10 years, and we found the frequency of sex reverse females has gone up from a couple of percent to more than 20% now. So with global warming happening, uh, 
probably this population will be all females, which is not a very good thing to be as far as um, not becoming extinct as we know. So changes in the sex system are actually quite frequent in reptiles, and this is the whole phylogeny of this, this kind of lizard in Australia. Uh, so there's a whole lot of lizards that are closely related that all have genetic sex determination and have the same sex chromosomes. But as closest related re relations actually have chemical sex determination, so there must have been a flip-flop there. And if you go back even further, these next closest relations all have genetic sex determination but a different chromosome. And if you go right back, the ancestors all have temperature sex determination. So it looks like there's been a lot of flip-flops between temperature and genetic sex determining mechanisms. So these mechanisms are much more flexible than we thought. Well, can we do this as humans? Well, no, because temperature sex determination doesn't work very well when you're stuck at 37 degrees. So we're stuck with our XY system until we run out of Y. Well, we've been able to use this dragon lizard to solve a mystery that's bedeviled people for 50 years, and that is how does temperature sex determination work? Um, and it's been a real problem because uh, temperature is all confounded with sex and hormones, and you can't easily separate them. But of course we can, because we have two kinds of mating females. So what we did was we looked at the RNA that was being made by our normal ZZ males and normal ZW females and sex reverse ZZ females and tried to see, is there something special about the genes that are active? And we found, yes, there's some spectacular differences. One thing we noticed was that one of the stress genes is very much upregulated, about 200 times normal. So it looks like the high temperature is inducing stress in these animals. And there's a whole pathway of stress genes there. But the other thing which was totally unexpected is we saw unique transcripts of very interesting genes. So here's a gene that's called Jared 2 and um, it's got a whole lot of uh, what we call exons. These are the bits that survive um, clipping out. Uh, so normally the big bits in between the exons are spliced out when the RNA is processed into messenger RNA. And so if we look at the ZW females, ZZ males, it's correctly spliced out. But when we looked at our sex reversed females, we found that one intron that should be spliced out was still there. Now this intron is full of chain termination codons which will stop um, protein synthesis. So what this means is that this uh, transcript won't work so the gene, the Jared 2 gene, which is normally expressed, you won't get a protein out of it. This is actually true of another related gene. These the two genes are in the family called the Jumanji genes, and they're very interesting genes because they're involved in epigenetics. And they also retain the same intron. Interestingly, too, if we went to alligators and marine turtles, we found sex differences in the same intron in the same two genes. So we think we're onto something very, very general. Or well, how does this mediate temperature sex determination? We're guessing here, but what we're saying is that the normal messenger RNA makes a protein, we'll call it J, and it's actually a part of a very important complex which regulates the epigenetic silencing. But if there's stress and this particular gene turns on um, and this intron is no longer spliced out correctly, this won't make a protein and you'll get a, a complex which doesn't work. And somehow or other this interacts with the sex determining pathway and you don't get a, a male out of it. So we think we would like now to put these three pathways together and figure out how it really happens. Well, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there's lots of examples in fish in which epigenetic mechanisms are involved in sex determination. We know quite a lot about them now. Um, and some of these fish actually regularly change sex when they get to a certain size. And it seems like, again, the epigenetic regulators, the stress hormones are there. And my favorite is the blue head wrasse. Uh, is that blue fish there is the only male. The yellow ones are all females. If you take away the male, the biggest 
female becomes male in two weeks flat. And so we've traced the changes in the gene activity and again it looks like the same set of the common factors, the stress genes, the epigenetic genes on hormones and transcription factors. So we think we probably are on the way now to be able to explain temperature sex. So there's even epigenetics in mammal sex. Um, some of these genes are involved in uh, methylation, in, um, in this uh, epigenetic modification of chromosome, in demethylation, um, and binding of transcription factors that allow SRY to work. So upstream of SRY, there are the same old genes again, and SRY then acts to make a male. So epigenetics is everywhere, even when you have sex chromosomes. So I just want to conclude now by saying, well, I think what we've been able to show is that many different genes can trigger the same pathway of sex determination. And different regions of different chromosomes can acquire these novel genes, and then they go through the same process of specialisation and self-destruction that our X and Y have gone. And this happens in flies and everything independently. Uh, but also sex can be determined without sex chromosomes at all, just by an epigenetic uh, factor triggered by the environment. And lastly, that new genetic or epigenetic systems are really quite frequent, and you can get these very frequent flip-flops. So I hope you're convinced then that it's really quite useful to look at weird animals, weird animals like kangaroos and platypuses and things, because um, if you just study humans and mice, you find out all about humans and mice, but you may miss the really important changes. And I'll just show you a picture uh, very quickly of all the people in my lab who have been involved with this work over many, many years um, in platypuses and emus and frogs and snakes and, and dragons. And so it's been such a lot of fun working with these weird animals and these amazing people. Thank you. Thank you very much for this enthralling story of the discoveries. And even a non-biologist like me could understand. So that thank you very much. That was my plan. <laughs> but now I'm sure that people who understand things you go in much better will have questions to ask. So any questions? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your yeah, question. So why in ah, yes. Yes. Why yes. in the species where sex is determined through temperature or temperature dependent, why males would be preferred at colder temperatures and females would be preferred at higher temperatures? Well, in, in fact, uh, they're just two sides of the same distribution. So what we find in, in all temperature sex uh, determining species, uh, is that there's an optimum temperature at which you can be male. And on both sides, you're female. So for instance, alligators are female at a lower temperature, male at a higher temperature, but if you push the temperature up even further, they start being female again. So in alligators, you see this part of the curve, and in marine turtles, which is the other way around, you see the other part of the curve. as ever. It's really nice to see the history of where all our sex genes came from. Uh, I'm actually curious on how the sex reversed uh, females that you had in the temperature dependent system. Um, do, uh, have, are you now discovering new versus compensation? Because by intron retention, you're actually creating a non-functional transcript, which is going to be pushed to the duration. So is this another way by which We don't actually see dosage compensation um, outside of mammals. Uh, 
Um, even birds have very imperfect dosage compensation. There are a few genes that are compensated, but most genes are not compensated at all or just a little bit compensated. We have started to look at that question in dragons, um, and we don't see dosage compensation, certainly not two to one dosage compensation. So again, I will guess that there'll be some genes where it's very important that they're compensated, but not these ones as far as we can tell. So it's the complex formation that is the... Uh, again, we're totally guessing here. We have not looked at the complex, uh, but we just saw these genes and thought, hmm, those are interesting looking genes. What do they do? And we discovered that the Jomorongi genes, um, the JARA2 gene at least, is part of the polycone repressive complex. So we think that's interesting, and of course, what we want to do now is actually look at it, find out what it does, and how does it interact with the FF1. There are some chemical, there's, there's another question. Uh, if you feed the seeds, uh, the seeds of the them with some inhibitors for these methyl transferases, et cetera, do you see well, We've tried that. Generally, what happens is everybody dies. So um, what we're trying to do now is to develop an, um, a culture, a gonad culture, in which uh, you know, we don't have to worry about the egg dying. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do, of course, is to look at azacitabine and, and butyrate and other things. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. So as you just mentioned uh, a while back, that only uh, like mammalian species so show uh, Within mammals, we get some very big size differences. I mean, even in primates, there's some species which have very large male-female differences and others where it, there's no difference whatsoever. Uh, so I suspect that's probably an independent pathway. Uh, but having said that, we know that in fish, a lot of the sexotoning genes are actually modified growth hormone genes. So it may be that and, and for instance, in the angelfish, which regularly changes from female to male during development, it's a size um, that once it crosses that size, it becomes male. So there's, there's some kind of tie-in between the, the growth and the sex determination. Thank you, ma'am. interesting to consider what evolutionary advantage TSC might have in certain circumstances. And I work with a lot of ecologists who spend their whole lives wondering why you know, TSD is good for alligators, because there doesn't seem to be a, a sex determining, a, a sex chromosome system there. And the best story I've heard is that it's essentially a population regulation device, because female alligators prefer to, to make their nests down near the water where it's cool. And these are female producing nests. But when the population pressure is high, they're forced to make their nests up on the top of the levees uh, where it's hot. And so these are male producing. So when the population's low, you make a lot of females. When it's high, you make a lot of males and they fight each other and the best one wins. And so you get male-male competition. So I think probably, probably it's going to be very different for, for very different species. Uh, you now, are there uh, advantages to being a TSD species for our dragon lizards. We, d we don't know. This is something, uh, we, we have dragon lizards all over Australia, so we're now starting to look at populations in, in uh, the tops of mountains and down by the sea and hot bits and cold bits because uh, uh, I think we maybe get some answers there about you know, what is driving the, the system towards TSD or towards uh, GSD. Not only temperature, but 
I'm sorry, I didn't follow the last part of your question. Temperature and the steroids plays a key uh, means to act Um, I stay away from hormones because they're so complicated. But but obviously, for particularly for reptiles and birds, the, the sex hormones are extremely important because you can actually completely reverse sex with estrogen, for instance. And you can't do that with placental mammals. Uh, and, and so I, I, I see them as being very much downstream events. So they're, they're generally, you have gonad um, differentiation first and then you, you get sex sorry, steroids after that. So a lot of the phenotypic differences between males and females are going to be as a result of the steroid hormones. But of course the, the hormones can actually feed in at the top of the chain and completely reverse the, the sex at least in, in uh, fish and, and in, um, in reptiles but not, not mammals. I'm sorry, I can't hear you well. Hello? Uh, Hello? Uh, in DSA reptiles, people are shown that when they are treating the climate as winter, they are seeing the sex reversal at particular temperature. So... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't follow yes. your question. Uh -huh. Perhaps we could speak about it afterwards? Uh, that's what I was going to say. Sure. Direct of map. Uh, I'm just curious, in the, like you mentioned in the fish, the blue head grass as well as in sea anemone, the female keeps changing into male. So I was curious, what's the trigger? Because thoughts themselves cannot change the fish. Is there, do the males keep secreting factors such as pheromones or something else to actually cause the thing? With the blue head grass, it's even more mysterious than that because they've done experiments where there is no transfer of pheromones or any chemicals. Um, so it seems to be visual cues because well, what I was told is that if you put a female wrasse on one side of a glass plate in an aquarium and put a bigger fish on the other side, she won't change to a male. But if you put a smaller fish on the other side, she'll change very rapidly into a male. And if you put a mirror there, she goes crazy because she can't judge size. So somehow she must be judging size and what we think now is that this is a very stressful situation. You know, am I bigger and am I smaller? Very stressful. So again, you're upregulating those stress genes, which is impacting somehow or rather on the epigenetic mechanisms that silence things. But that's a wonderful situation because in the blue head wrasse, the, uh, the females have a real ovary. It's not an ovotestis, so it's not a question of just... Um, differential growth of one end or the other end of the gonad. You know, it really is a de-differentiation of the ovary and it looks like it's some kind of a stem cell um, state that they go through and then they start re-differentiating into testis. So it's going to be really interesting to have a look at those transcripts. Uh, what would happen uh, uh, in active markers during uh, sex uh, determination and uh, temperature sex determination uh, active markers? Um, we don't know yet. Uh, nobody has looked, but that's a thing we're obviously going to look at is, is the, the markers that we know to be uh, associated with activity or in inactivity. Because at the moment we, didn't, don't, we, we have guessing as to what the target is, but it's probably not guess F1 itself is probably something upstream or downstream of SF1. So we've got a lot of work to do to identify what, what the complex is, what the complex does, what it binds to, and what it changes. So I'll bet more like my, my uh, Rube Goldberg uh, pathway than the pathway we, we draw with a few straight lines. <laughs> It'll be really quite complex, I'm sure. Okay, so... I don't see any more hands. So I think you will all join with me. Really wonderful.
the story of an extremely complicated subject. And first, to begin with, on behalf of the Indian Academy of Sciences, I would like to present you Vijit Mohito. Thank you very much. So thank you very much again for this wonderful lecture. And now it's my pleasure to invite all of you for coffee on the other side of the corridor, where you can talk with her even more if you wish.